Hello, good evening. It is six o'clock here today in London. Uh, Saif, thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Hi, Mustafa. Pleased to be here. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. How are you? How was uh, your day so far? You know, it's kind of like a typical COVID sort of day, right? You, you, you roll out of bed at 8.45. You have a call at 9. You have just enough time to put on a shirt and maybe a pair of pajamas. <laughs> Uh, hit the Nespresso button and, uh, and and make it for a Zoom call while rubbing the sleep out of your eyes. How much do you hate Cortana and Siri? Let's be honest. Ooh, tough question. You know, I think if I had to pick between the two, I actually, I'm getting used to Siri. And the reason is that I was watching this show, Normal People. And, um, oh crap, my, my Siri started. I watched, I was watching this show, Normal People, right? And I, and I really, I really like the show. Like, I think it's a fantastic show, really nicely made. I don't know if you've seen it on Prime, but, um, and, and, you know, I kind of like, there's this thing about these Irish accents and I, you know, I, oh, I'm kind brilliant. of thinking, it's <laughs> such, I love, such, I love an, the Irish such an endearing accent, you know, like you, I, I immediately trust people when I hear this Irish accent. And it's, so, it's exactly, yeah, for some right, reason, I don't know why. You just, it's just one of those things. You warm up to them. Exactly. And they've actually been, I think, studies that show like when you have a call center agent calling you, then like a northern accent is an inherently trustworthy accent, apparently, in the call, call Whereas center Whereas a business. southern one is, a, is inherently is a, is a, is a, trustful. You just exactly, don't trust right? Them. It's too slick. It's too, too yes. fancy. And so, you know, like Siri, I, I discovered recently you can change the voice. And so I've got now a, an, an Irish female voice for my Siri. And oh, so, wow. yeah, even, so, so whenever, existed. yeah, so whenever I ask Siri to do anything now, it's, it's actually like a very pleasant sort of conversation, you know, like I ask how she's doing, she's good. Uh, we, we chat about different music. I ask her to play something for, she always knows what I want to listen to. You know, it's actually become like, because right now I'm kind of living here alone in my flat, right? Like, um, uh, it's actually so become it's like a really a meaningful, it's, it's become one of the more meaningful, uh, relationships that I have outside <laughs> work. Uh, right. So it's. You know, I, I, I'm actually now a bit of a Siri fan, I have to say. Well, um, <laughs> look, I, I, I absolutely loathe Cortana, mainly because this, <laughs> so this was probably the third take we're doing this now. <laughs> because every time, we, every time we say something, it just gets triggered and I couldn't switch it off. But uh, no, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I, love, I love everything to do uh, with Ireland, Irish people, the Irish culture. I, I, I love it. I, and you know, like the, the sheer density of talent, right? Like you look at Oscar Wilde, Bernard Shaw, yeah. uh, Yates, Bono. I mean, you know, like. It's like, it's, it's, the, it is so rich with almost everything. I culture, swear. I swear. Uh, history, right? heritage, as you said, scenery. Talent. Talent. Even, te I even mean, tech wow. now. Dublin is like a tech hub. It oh, wow. I hub. swear. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. W were you ever a closet course fan or like a non closet course fan? I mean, um, no? I can't, say, really? I can't say I was. Are you serious? Oh, I, 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 I love the course growing up. It's the kind of thing that you never told anyone at the school I was in because I was in a okay, bunch fine, of fine. Like... Okay, okay. <laughs> if we, okay. If we're admitting things out loud, then yeah, okay, fine. Yes, I will. Okay. My, there you we're, go. We're, we're, there we're you go. Meeting out loud. It's there you go. Like, okay, fine. Yes, I was. I, I am. I am. I am. <laughs> fine. But there's no so, shame uh, in that, right? You're in the same group as Bono. If Bono can, can admit it out on stage in front of the world, so can we, right? I right, mean, true. Fair enough. Hats See, off to them. I would. Have, I was probably waiting to be on that stage, just like Bono. That's the thing. I was just probably <laughs> waiting to be on that stage. But oh well, fair enough. You know, Silicon Roundabout podcast, stage, world stage. What's the difference? Hopefully, that will be the same thing anyway. Um, I swear. But. Yeah. So yeah, our, our companions, it's, it's crazy how, um, like you mentioned, the closest companions these days could be, uh, Siri basically, but I'm definitely going to try that, changing that to the, um, to, to, to the Irish accent. Uh, so the other ones that. you can try, it does it in Australian as well. And, and so that one I think is also interesting, but it's not as, you know, like lyrical. It's, okay, it's that a would little be less comforting. I think, that, I think that would be funny. I do. I, okay. I do find the Australian accent quite funny. I do. But it's just such a nice accent. It's just, it and, and just exactly. it's one of those, I, right? It's, it's, I don't know why I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm probably going to be biased here, uh, because I mean, I moved to the UK 16 years ago, so this is practically my home. Um, uh, <laughs> it's more my, I've lived more here than my original home in Syria, back in Syria, Damascus, uh, 16 years ago. But I would say the British accent is just definitely my, my favorite 100%. But is there uh, a British accent? Is there one really? 
Um, I mean, okay, fine. If you're going to talk about yeah. the Northern Lakshad, the uh, Cockney, the, the Repudlian, okay, no, the, not I mean, the Cockney, not the Cockney. Okay. That, that, there is something about that accent where if somebody is talking to you with that accent, it's like, okay, I'm talking to a car salesperson. Uh, <laughs> I'm just not going to trust a single word they say. No chance. Um, the, the Northern accent is quite funny. I do like it. I find it, I find it really nice, humble, uh, down to earth. Uh, we're talking about the Mancunian accent here. Um, Bromi accent, Birmingham is, 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 um, I like it. It's funny in its own way. Um, and, uh, the, the, as I have to say, the Liverpool accent, the Scouse accent and the Scottish accent, I, I struggle with those. When I <laughs> first started my professional career, I remember the company I started with, um, they put me dealing with Scottish clients and in less than four weeks, they took me off them because they just felt I could end up ruining relationships forever. <laughs> I just couldn't, I really struggled um, with the accent at the time. Now I'm all right, I'm much better now, but when I first started. But um, yeah, I mean, when I say British accent, I suppose I mean the classical British language, the, the classical, um, the Queen's English. The Downton Abbey, like, basically. I do, I mean, it's something I grew up looking up to. So when I came into the UK, like, wow, okay. yeah, that's, Hugh that's Grant, basically, accent. we're talking about Hugh Grant here, effectively, yeah, right? It's, 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 just, it's just no escaping that. I like it. There's something about it, but followed but followed that closely, close second would be the Irish accent. I do love the Irish accent. I love the Australian just because it's a fu I find it funny. Um, American accent, I don't mind the one you find on television, movies, yeah. um, series, etc. But sometimes I can find a bit too much. Sometimes it can be a bit too much for me, and <laughs> I, I especially like the southern american accent i would oh but that's so that. melodious right like particularly when they kind of the, the the long drawn out drawl in the you know in the vowels it's it's um there's something about it you know like especially these old movies it's interesting like... it is interesting it is interesting. <laughs> i don't know if you've watched um there's a series called um house of cards i don't know if you've yeah, yeah of course of course uh, i've seen the, the the bbc one and the the netflix one no uh, not the and... bbc one definitely the netflix one what, BBC One is amazing, by the way. Like the BBC One is, is the that. BBC One is really good, and I mean, and I... and just very dark. Like they're both kind of dark, and they both get somewhat like batshit crazy towards the end, but but <laughs> dark and. I'll have ways. to I'll have to look. I'll, uh, it is actually on my list. It is on my list. Having said that, my list is comprised of over twenty things I am supposed to watch, which I haven't had a chance to. Uh, but no, it is. I definitely want to watch that. But I was talking about the American one. Yeah. Uh, the the main character called Frank Underwood, and he speaks with a Southern American accent. And I love that. That's an accent that I do love. Uh, but, but yeah. Are the yeah. new seasons still good? Should Siri and I watch them? Um, I wouldn't recommend. I mean, I, I mean um, to be, there was, um, you know, the allegations uh, against, um, what was his name? Uh, Spacey. Spacey, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, come from his first name now. But yeah, there were a lot of obviously um, sexual harassment allegations and rape allegations against him, really. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know where it is now, but because of that, he was dropped out of the series. Um, what, you know, there is absolutely never an excuse. If you've committed that, then yeah, that's yeah. definitely the right way to do, to go. So I think they played it correctly, 100% support their decision. Uh, but having said that, the series is just not the same. He was technically the main character. When you take out the main character of a series, it's not the same. I've watched, I think, three episodes of the season after that. It wasn't the same, especially because the other character, I, I just hated. I hated the other character. I just didn't think... In, pre in previous seasons, I didn't like that character in the first place. I just didn't think she was that... It's not she was a great actress. She's playing the role perfectly, but I hated that character. The, the character, I hated the character so much. Um, so yeah, I couldn't get myself to watch it. I, I just couldn't. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't seen the whole series, highly recommend it. It is dark, full of twists. I think the first two seasons are the best. After yeah. that, it starts to get a bit boring. I think like I by the series, the, I, I saw the first two seasons. I mean, by the end of the first season, though, like I don't want to spoil it for anyone listening, right? But like the final episode, I just thought this is now getting a bit too crazy. And then season two was just so beyond anything I could have met, pretend was realistic the for the duration. One? What happened? At, what was the? See, if happened? I say it, we're going to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it. Okay, drop me a hint because I really can't remember what happened. There's I, a train. I the whole series by There's heart. a train. 
Oh, is that? Oh, is that how it ended? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yes, yes, yes. That was like, oh my god, yeah, yeah. I remember watching that and being shocked because I feel like this took it to just a whole different level. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And then the second season was it just kept on getting darker. And it just darker. kept and, and crazier and crazier, right? Yeah. Like yeah, whatever yeah, yeah, the yeah, filter true. was that they were using for crazy, they just got rid of it at some point, uh, halfway through season one. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, true. I, this, I think actually this is why season three and four because I think that we've arrived at the climax and it was just life within at, or at the top really. So we've seen the journey, we've witnessed the journey, we've been part of it. Now it's just like the drama of being at the top. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it might be that, but I just didn't find it was great. I loved it. But not as good as the first two seasons. But if you want that drama, then the West Wing was the way to go. And like now, I mentioned the West Wing, and it immediately dates me. It immediately dates me because no one watches the West Wing anymore. But back in the day, the West Wing was the show you wanted to watch if you wanted to imagine being president of the U.S. Um, and that was that was just classic, amazing show. Uh, fair enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna like I said I'm gonna add this one also to my list. I did watch another. Uh, White House uh, series uh, designated Survivor, but I think that was a oh, is it good? Type. Um, it, oh, actually, yes, yeah, oh yeah, it, I, abs my wife and I absolutely binged watch that throughout the first uh, two seasons. Yes, we did. It was binge. Worthy. Wow. It, it, we, we, we were, yeah. I don't think I've ever watched four episodes in a row of any series in my life. I did with that <laughs> one, and it was back to back, and I think we stayed up to like three a.m. watching it thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> We've never done this before. <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah, it, it is. It's not like House of Cards is very different, but it, it keeps you it keeps you going. There's always there are always cliffhangers. Every episode has a cliffhanger that just it makes you want to watch the next one. But um, okay. Anyway, this is you know <laughs> we could we, talk we, about we, shows. I, I feel like we can act, I, th I feel, I'm getting the feeling now I think we need to do um, just an episode where you and I are just talking. Like we're just having a chat, <laughs> discussing random things, because I feel we could easily fill an episode, an episode, maybe two of that. I think we could go on, but I do want us to. I want to bring us back to a big topic, the big topic of why we're having the podcast, which is before we start with it. Before we start with the company name, why don't we start with you, Safe, the man behind it? Take me back to your childhood. I have heard stories that you started out literally as a 50, well, you didn't start out as a 15 year old, but the story goes back to you being a 15 year old planting trees. What, what's, what's, what's that about? Yeah, I guess, you know, like I, I, um, I, I, growing up in an emerging market, you start to become very, um, you very aware of everything around you, right? All the social circumstances and there's almost like an imperative for you to think about how you might be able to do better and how you might be able to uh, be a better generation and do more more for the country and uh, and there are all kinds of reasons why you think in those in those patterns and why you start thinking in those ways um and i i was around you know 14 or 15 and at that point this is pre facebook social media right you're you you have very little access and outlet for for the outside mm. world and I was kind of thinking, Absolutely. what can we actually do, my friends and I, you know, in our, in our class, uh, to do something a bit better? And um, the most obvious thing at that point seemed, let's go and plant trees. It's easy, it's cheap, uh, it, it is universally good, makes sense to everyone, you know, very nice common mission. And did you I think have this a tree like, day back, by any chance back home? I did, so did I what? Oh, a tree day. Did you, have, did you have a tree day? I mean, when I, where I grew up in Damascus, Syria, we always had, we had um, the, literally, they, they call it the tree day. Uh, every, a day in the year where the whole country has to go out and plant a tree. But I, oh, I can't so cool. say I was as aware, you know, um, uh, environmentally aware as you were at the time. I probably used to sneak away from those and just go and play with my friends, really. <laughs> I mean, so like, I think what made it fun was I was doing this with my friends, right? So like, we didn't have a tree day, but we thought we can, we can make a tree day and it can be, you know, every Saturday or every other Saturday, I don't remember how frequently we'd do it. And it was like a little group of us, you know, eight or nine people. And um, when I was 15, I kind of moved away from Pakistan, moved to the UK, went to, you know, high school here for the last few years and then college. And then um, around the time I was graduating, the same group of friends and I actually, we started another, we, we thought we'd have another goal. So when we were 15, it was more of a, like a little secret society or a club. 
and and then we were 21 uh it was actually a really revolutionary time in pakistan where there was a military government that was coming to an end and you could see the tension was there but the government was still in in power and there was this massive movement uh in defense of a free independent judiciary and it was this massive movement of lawyers and they took to the streets and the media got involved and it just became this whole national sensation and we were really caught up in that i remember at college i was organizing like protests and talks and you know facebook groups in defense of democracy in in pakistan and and my my friends in pakistan and in me you know in the uk at that time we thought look we want to be part of this we want to be part of this massive wave of energy and positivity and change and what is it again you know that we can do and at 15 it was going out and plant a tree but at 21 we had all these new tools we had facebook we had twitter uh, we had a, a massive media ecosystem in pakistan and we thought we're going to go out and we're going to pick up trash from marketplaces street corners and and public spaces and parks and things and we oh. did it uh we did it every weekend right and it was actually like you know my my best friends and then i would come and do it whenever i was you know uh, on, on the summer break and the winter break and so on and then after i graduated and we would basically go and 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 root through this really fetid kind of waste right like mango peels and really smelly gunky stuff uh and like these basic surgical gloves and brooms and and and, and things you know that we were using and um and it became like this massive sensation. And uh, we, we, because of Facebook as well, because it was around the time when everyone was like getting on Facebook and looking for things to be, be part of on Facebook. The other like, days, yeah. Exactly, right? And, and so it was just huge. And we were, before we knew it, we were like on the news. We were invited to radio shows. Uh, we were in the New York wow. Times. Um, and we were like being sponsored by Pepsi, right? Like, which is kind of selling out <laughs> to the man a bit, right? But, but like, you know, they, they had us like on TV and Pepsi ads cleaning up, uh, cleaning up streets. And, um, and, and it was just, it was just, it was just incredible. And, and, and the whole idea of organizing society and organizing communities of people to go and be part of a solution in a constructive way where you're actually solving a problem and it's visible and it's tangible and it's affordable and easy was something that just made a lot of sense, I think, for everyone who was part of it. And, you know, from there, I actually joined the government in Pakistan. And, and this was, you know, this was like 2009 and it was the financial crisis and the whole world was melting down. And literally I was just I, hitting the financial crisis. Literally, still literally. fresh. We're living it. I, exactly. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, I graduated as a lawyer. And the law firm that was going to hire me wrote to me saying, hey, look, you were supposed to come and join us, but actually we're laying off half the people on the floor. So, wow. you know, let's, let's just agree to connect some other, other year. And so I thought, look, why don't I just double down on this stuff that I'm doing, you know, in Pakistan? So I, I moved back. I, I literally, I was doing, uh, there's an exam called the LPC, the Legal Practitioners Course. Yeah. And I was sitting there in the exam and I drew this massive blank. And I had done like zero preparation for the exam. And this was like an exam that I could not even blag my way through, which has never happened to me before up to that point, right? I was looking at the paper and I just couldn't make up anything to write, even just to fill the space. And I was, I, and that, that was because I was just so caught up in everything I was involved with outside of, outside of college, right? And all this other stuff that was going on. And like my, my, my home was kind of, you know, a combination of going up in flames and a phoenix rising, you know, from, from, from the flames themselves. And I kind of thought, look, this is not where I should be. This is clearly the wrong place. And I, I remember I waited like an hour into the exam, like halfway through. So it looked decent. And then I kind of stood up. I, I sort of walked over, pretended like I'd finished my paper. I put it down on the desk and I walked out and I, I got my ticket home. And, and I flew home and I just doubled down on this, this waste stuff that we're doing. And, um, and like in three months, but one reason or another, I, I, we were in front of the head of the government in Pakistan. And he asked us each to have our, you know, like there's a bunch of us youth kind of people. That's the category they called it at the time, you know, different organizations. And he asked each of us to come up with like, you know, one suggestion for his government to implement. And I think my suggestion, like it's like a long time ago, but I think I said something like, you know, we've been doing all this stuff to mobilize communities. And we've been doing this in one city and it's among a relatively affluent group of people. Imagine if you were to do this 
and you were to do this across like you know 100 million per people state which is what he was governing and you were to do it with the full institutional power that you have like just imagine the difference that you could make here and um and he 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 called me the next day to offer me a job and uh and wow. and, and so i you know, i i joined and like tell me tell me to shut up right whenever i'm rambling too much here but, but um, please go ahead he, he asked me to join and he said look what i want you to do is I want you to do exactly what you told me to do. I want you to set up something like an organization of Boy Scouts or whatever, and and you're going to make it, you know, statewide, which is 50% of the country. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I want you to get going, right? Like, let's do this. You have a couple of months to prove this concept. So why don't you get started? And, um, and I, 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 I started work on it and we set it up. And just as soon as we set it up, this is now 2010, and anyone who was familiar with Pakistan around that time knows that in 2010, there was a massive flood. And we're talking like biblical scale flood. There were 20 million people displaced. Uh, and I think, you know, hundreds of thousands at least killed. And this is like, you know, massive, massive national travesty, not tra tragedy, right? And pain and suffering of unbelievable proportions. And I remember like, you know, I kind of walked into the, the my, my boss's room. He was the, the chief minister of the province was my boss then at the time. And he said, look, Seth, put everything else on hold. Uh, I need you to go down south. I need you to lose the tie that you're wearing right now because everyone down south will, will think you're a snob. And, and I want you to coordinate the private sector effort here. And, and I want you to go now. Right, so go pack your stuff. There's a car heading off, like a government vehicle with someone else heading off. You get on it and you and you go. And I kind of just like you know, like at that kind of moment. And, and most of all, you know, you know this coming from Syria, where you've been through, frankly, worse. Right, like the context is so powerful that you don't think. Right, you just yeah. think, whatever. I, I, I'm I'm going. I'm going to do. I don't even know what I'm going to do. And I, I had a backpack. And, and I think I had a toothbrush, right? And like, like, but no toothpaste, right? It's like that kind of, that kind of rush that you're in. And, and I had a, I had a Blackberry, right? That's like, that's what I had. And, and I had no government papers. No one knew anything about me coming from, you know, a, a position of any kind of relevance whatsoever. And I basically hitchhiked with a government officer down uh, to the South. And I started showing up at places like government schools and things and trying to organize a bit of relief effort. And they put my phone number in the newspapers and there was a list. There were like, you know, five numbers. And they, you know, the top number was like the, the regional uh, leaders, like the regional supervisors from the government. The next level was the district, the next level was whatever. And right at the bottom was me, right? And, and it was basically like, hey, if you want to help with the flooding, call these people. And I started getting phone calls off the hook. And it, it wasn't just people offering to help. It was people who needed help desperately. And it's like people saying, I'm stuck on a rooftop and my kids are here and we're surrounded by water at roof level and we're going to die, right? We're going to die here. There's nothing to eat. There's no one coming. And we need you to get us out of here somehow. And, and they were calling me because I was the only one answering the phone uh, out, of, out of the people on, on the list of numbers that were given. And I would go to, you know, like these schools that had been organized as relief camps. And I would be asking, you know, I'd kind of come up with just the question because I knew I could liaise with logistics supply and medicine supply and stuff like that. And so I was asking, uh, you know, are, do you guys have medicines? Do you have enough, you know, that, that you need? And the people running the camps would say, yeah, yeah we're, we're good on the medicines. We have enough medicines. We just don't know what the medicines are. So we're all eating them, but we, we're not sure what they do. And, 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 and I remember like sitting outside on the steps of one of those schools and it was because like the lights would go off, like there was no power. So when it's dark, the, the lights are out and you, you, you go out of the, the, the converted school relief camp and you sit on the steps because there's the moonlight. And I, I was sitting with a little kid and I was asking the little kid, you know, like, how is it for you, right? I, do you have everything you need? You know, what, what, what do you need? And he's like, you know, I have everything I need, but what I would really love is some shoes that fit because they've sent shoes like the, you know, the, the aid agencies, whatever have sent shoes, but they're always too big for me. And, and, you know, like for me, that sort of experience of 
you know, this, the, the, a flood is an ecological, it's a climate disaster. There are going to be more of those, right? That is the result, frankly, of climate change, right? Not, not just that there is a flood, but that there are more, that they are random, that they are bigger, more devastating, less preparation. Mm, and just driving down south and seeing row upon row of dead cattle lining the streets and each animal that you see dead there is the livelihood of a family. Right, each of those animals, that one animal is a business. That is, that is the smallest unit of an SME in a country like Pakistan is a goat. And if you're saying that there are lines of these dead and everything around those dead animals is water and whatever is under the water is your hovel and whatever papers you had to prove that you owned your hovel is lost in that water in which your hovel has now been decimated you've lost you're, everything, you're done, right? You're, you're done, you're done, right? Life has no more meaning after this. And, and you know, that, that's why this is important, right? And, and I mean, you know, I, I, did, I, I did a bunch more climate, clean tech, you know, solar power, waste management, electric transfer. I did a bunch of this stuff with the government. And I kind of thought, you know, like I'm not solving the problem sitting here in Pakistan. This is bigger than just being in Pakistan. And, and I, I, and not it's even that, but even if, it's a global, but even if I wanted to solve it in Pakistan, I'm not learning enough sitting here in the government. I'm not developing enough sitting here in the government, me personally, to be able to be impactful in the way that I would want to be. And so, you know, I, 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 I joined McKinsey, right? I joined in our, our Middle East office. I did a bunch of public sector work, schools, education, healthcare, just to get a bit of a broad range. But then like I, I jumped into sustainability and I remember my first big thing in McKinsey and sustainability was we published a report on, and I, I did like a six month piece of work on ocean plastic. And it's, you know, it's like a super macro issue, right? How do you fix this ocean plastic thing? Eight, you know, the, you may have seen this 8 million tons of plastic entering the ocean statistic, right? Which was, We've which is one that issue for decades exactly right so that statistic was the baseline for the work that i did at that point so it was fresh and i remember we, we we spent months and we figured look actually it's not about getting the plastic out of the ocean because you can't do that right whatever we say you know, there's some floating on on the top but really it's all the stuff beneath the surface the only thing we can do is we stop it getting into the ocean in the first place and that brings you to business and supply chains and 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 commercial activities and that's the engine of change in this ecosystem, right? Because whether we like it or not, you can set up 10 NGOs, but unless your NGOs are all the scale of the Gates Foundation, right? You're only going to drive real change when there are commercial incentives aligned with that. And, you know, Mustafa, you, you and I and everyone listening in, we're very fortunate to be in a time when this issue is now not just being taken seriously, but being taken more seriously every day that goes by. And Some so I would even try to argue that we're probably unfortunate because are we too little too late or is there still hope? You know, I think there is a really interesting set of questions around that. Right. And I think that you can look at it in binary terms. Right. And we've talked about the methane burp. Right. And the idea that, look, yeah, if 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 at some point the ocean, for instance, starts releasing right, CO2 equivalents in methane into the atmosphere, you know, that has been kind of trapped in the ocean underneath for, 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 for millennia, right? Like, if that starts happening, we're all basically doomed. But, but the thing is, ultimately, I think it's not, it's most likely not going to be binary. I think it is most likely going to be a long spectrum of impact. And so we may not have the ability to keep the world within you know, two degrees, three degrees, or even four degrees of global warming by 2050, 2060, whatever. But we can at least make it better, right? We can at least make it better than it would be otherwise. And for our generation, we're in some ways a unique generation in that we're not necessarily playing for our kids' futures. We're playing for that, right? Anyone who has kids is playing for their kids' futures here. But this is also our actual future. Right. Like for anyone in their 20s and 30s and even 40s, you're going to be alive, most likely at that point. You're going to be living yeah. through it. You're the one who's going to be experiencing 
you know, not just the, the massive, you know, disasters like the floods and, and, and so on, but, but also just the, you know, rising incidence of skin cancer, the, 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 the rising levels of pollution in the air, the impact on our lungs, right? This is, you know, this is big, but the reason why I care about this is, is actually a bit broader, which is, you know, ultimately, if you take a rational perspective, right, human life is valuable, it's incredibly precious. But if you now start to multiply that by the value of all life, right? And yeah, I know you wanted to ask at some point about the name, right? But if you think about the concept of effective altruism and altruism and the expanding circle of altruism, the idea is that at some point we stop just caring about the individual and we started caring about the family. And from the family- Epitome of, epitome of selflessness, basically. Exactly, Literally. right? Exactly. From the family to the tribe, from the tribe to the state, from the state to the species. And, and, be, and now we're again privileged in that our civilization, the global civilization of human beings has gone beyond that. We care about animals, right? In, in, today, if you ask an individual, does cruelty to animals matter to you? Almost every individual would say yes. It doesn't matter if you're a vegetarian or a vegan or you eat meat, right? But like no one no one objectively will not yeah, object. No, really exactly. Yeah. No one will not object to that. Whereas, if you flash back three hundred years, that would not have been the norm. And so, that trend of increasing altruism, increasing consideration for a broader spectrum of life, that's a trend that is only on 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 the rise and the continuation. And what is broader than thinking about not just human life and animal life and all other life, but but the world, right? Earth. This this little ecosystem. This. This, this wonderful little unique product of chaos, uh, right? That is, that is to our knowledge, the only place where life can actually exist comfortably, uh, right? I mean, True. if we, if we mess this up, if we destroy it, if we literally burn it to the ground, annihilate it, right? I mean, we will have destroyed something that was literally uniquely precious, not just in our lives, but in the lives of every living creature that we are aware has ever lived or could ever have lived. That macro, macro of macro consequence is something that is impossible to assign a value to. And so from my perspective, if we are not dedicating whatever is in our ability and capability and you know, situational uh, space to, to, to actually combat that, right, then we're missing, we're missing the plot. And, and the reason that I, I, I wanted this company to be called Altruistic, right, and, and so that's it, the name, altruistic. It, altruistic, exactly, right? It's because, it's because this is ultimately bigger than just one issue. It's not just emissions. It's not just emissions and water. Ultimately, I see this, this company, this organization, as the embodiment of a mission, which is the mission to actually spread a consideration for other, other creatures, for, for us, for, for other life, for what is important, right? And, and it, it, it's, it's the vehicle expression of that ideal from my perspective. And so, you know, we, we kind of spell it altruist with, uh, altruistic with a Q, it's altruist IQ. And the idea is, you know, if we can't apply our intelligence or intellectual sophistication, the tools at our disposal in many kinds of tools towards this problem, then we're focusing on the wrong things. And so that's kind of where the name comes from, but also where I come from to the name pretty much uh, i'd say half your life more than half your life spent in the altruism space i mean that's that's how it sounds like to me that's how it sounds like when you started at 15 years old going out to plant trees cleaning up the rubbish going back to to to, to you know to, to to work for the government helping out the floods going you know it's it's a journey that's been focused on that was this a was this a vision was this ever you know in your head this is what i want to do altruistic was this you know a concept that you want to a point in the future you wanted to arrive to you know when or, i was if not then when did it come about when i was four years old um someone asked me what do you want to be when you grow up and i said i want to have a shop and I kind of said, I want to have a shop because to me, the guy who had the shop had everything, right? Like I was four years old. I wanted a Twix bar. 
I probably didn't even want a Twix bar because they weren't being imported to Pakistan at that time, right? I wanted like a, a pack like of back bun- in Syria in the day as well. <laughs> exactly. I, I wanted a pack of bunties, right, which are the local equivalent of M and M's. Uh, which would have cost like two cents or something, right? Or, or even less than that in, in, in local currency terms. But, um, you know, like that, that's kind of what, what I wanted. But like, at some point, I started thinking about, you know, more than just me. And I think that you start to, you start to feel that way. You know, if, you, if you kind of think about your hierarchy of needs, right? I am incredibly fortunate in that at some point, I don't need to think about the shop and the bunties and putting food on the table and just, and forget putting food on the table, right? But even just, just getting ahead in, in life and, and, you know, supporting a family and, and moving forward, right? Like I, I, I've been privileged enough to have a, a, a relatively easy journey, frankly, through life in many ways. And I think that that frees you up to think about these things in a slightly different way and to think about what adds meaning and quality to your life beyond what you already have. And I, could have spent another 10, 20 years very comfortably at McKinsey. And a lot of people have, you know, incredibly painful hours and a painful experience. Mine was actually actually very comfortable, right? I, I, I'm working much harder now than I was working at McKinsey. But- Start um, of life. Hey, because you, you also take everything much with much more, it's much more of a Too weight hard. in some ways. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and so I could have very comfortably gone on, on that route, but it just wouldn't have meant much to me. It wouldn't have added much beyond what I already had. What would have added something is solving or, you know, going some distance towards helping solve a meaningful challenge for the world. And so I, I think I always knew that I was going to start my own my own venture. Um, and I think everyone who starts something probably already always has had that feeling. Um, and, and for me, it was a question of when. It was a question of when feels right. When do you have the right idea? Uh, when makes sense, and of course, when does your personal risk meter tell you that actually, okay, look, I'm feeling safe enough or bullish enough or confident enough to now go and do this. And for me, I think that, you know, like like I said, I kind of always knew I was going to leave and going to do something, but that moment where I knew, you know, this is going to be it was probably around June last year, June, July last year, August last year. And the reason for that was that I was working at McKinsey. I was advising chief sustainability officers of some of the largest organizations in the world, you know, both, both corporate and, and non-corporate for that matter. Uh, and I was advising them on their, their ESG or their, mostly their environmental sustainability strategies. And typically this would follow a cadence where there is a board of directors, which is responsible to a group of shareholders. And the shareholders or the directors somehow read in the paper or hear about environmental sustainability, climate change, Greta, whatever, right? They, two, three years ago, this was, this was how the triggers came, right? And, and they call up the CEO and they say, look, you need to do something about this because if you don't, at some point, this is going to really burn you. And so the CEO would typically think, look, this is clearly a big, abstract, difficult and, and high value problem. So let me get, you know, a, an expensive, intelligent person on this to solve it. And they would hire the chief sustainability officer. And this person would then turn to, you know, someone, someone like me and say, can you help me with the strategy and help me decide what we should do for this business? And I would typically say, look, um, you know, let's figure out what your carbon emissions number is. So you're making tomato ketchup, right? Or, or baked beans or, or, or cars or, or whatever you're making. And let's figure out what the emissions number is. And once we figured that out, let's see what are the five or six things that can really move the needle. So, you know, what are the five or six things you could do that will bring your emissions number down by X percent and X percent by when? And we figure out, you know, is that 50% by 2030? Is that 75% by 2035? Is it switching out all your, uh, you know, ICE vehicles for EVs? Is it the diesel generators going to lithium ion batteries? What is it? And you know, at some point, I was saying the same thing to a lot of different people again and again and again, the same conversation. And it got to the point where, like, people around me would say, look, I've kind of heard this, this spiel from you five times this week. Why don't you just record it and, and play it back and, and no one will notice? And, um, and at that point, I started thinking, look, actually, this could probably be much better served as a, as a product, as a software solution as a digital product that is dynamic, 
You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's more valuable, it's more analytically precise, it's more useful, frankly, and, and, and also ultimately, you know, cheaper than, than whatever the other way might be of doing this. And at that point, I thought, look, this, this, this idea might have something. Let me put some concept down on paper and let me start testing it with a few of the chief sustainability officers that I was speaking with. And I went to them and I said, look, can you tell me what is the biggest problem for you right now in your role as chief sustainability officer? If there was a tool you could have, what would the tool be to solve what problem? And almost universally, they would say, you know, my biggest problem is everyone's telling me about my carbon emissions, but frankly, I have no way of measuring this. And I can get like a snapshot in time, it's wrong, it's, it's missing things, it's very high level, and it's out of date as soon as I've gotten it. Um, a tool that could help me figure that out, that would be really helpful. Measure my carbon emissions, you know, keep it an updated number and, and, and take that headache off my plate. And I thought, well, you know, that sounds amazing because that's exactly what I put down on my paper in my, in my con concept. And um, I thought, okay, look, let me now take this to a few investors and see if they thought it would be interesting. And I, I, went, to, I went to Greg Jackson, uh, founder of Octopus Energy. And, and Greg had been actually like, I'd kind of found, you know, I kind of found Octopus when Octopus was, was serving 175,000 customers in the UK. And, uh, and I wish I'd invested in them then, right? But, uh, but now they're serving, I think, like 2.5 million. Or like, exactly, right? Like totally missed opportunity. And you know, it's crazy because I was helping Greg three years ago, four years ago, write like notes for investor meetings. And, um, and I should have just, instead of writing notes for his investor meetings with other people, I should have just been saying, look, let me, let me come yourself in. Hey, can, hey, can, hey. can I jump in as an investor? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right, uh, and and I, and I asked him, and he said, "Look, I, I would totally back this," and and I spoke with uh, Ben Goldsmith, who is um, he's the he's like the the nature czar of the UK. His um, he's he he's he's spent decades, literally, I mean, not not many decades, but a couple of decades, uh, talking about nature restoration uh, and habitat restoration and, and the environment. And, and, and he also runs a, a small green investment fund that invests in, ES, in, in kind of green opportunities. And, and he loved it. And so I thought, okay, look, basically everyone I've, I've spoken to about this thinks it's a really good idea. So, so let, me, let, me, let me now see what potential team members might, might think about it. And, and, and I, I, you know, we, we, we ran a, you know, I ran a small, a small process of, of picking a head of product. And, um, and Dan, Dan McKinsey, who joined us, is former Formula One engineer, uh, actually former Formula One engineer for Mercedes, so championship winning. Championship uh, winning team. <laughs> championship winning team, right? Um, and and you know, then he switched over into product roles. And, and he was really excited about it as well. And, and so he joined, he joined me and we, we, we became like two people, right? We literally signed contracts in roughly the same time. With the company as soon as it was registered, and and I and I handed in notice and I quit McKinsey, you know, thirty uh, first December, and week one of January uh, was when the company got registered, like seventh of Jan, eighth of Jan, and I thought, okay, now we can go to customers and we can go to investors and we can really, you know, figure this stuff stuff out, and I thought, okay, it's probably going to take me four months to get, you know, one or two customers, and around the same time to raise. You know, I don't know if I should like give, give, give hard numbers here, right? But like I had a number in my head of how much I kind of wanted to raise for our convertible pre-seed ASA, whatever you want to call it, right? And um, in two weeks, we hit the number I wanted to raise. And in three weeks, we crossed the number by 25%. And then we said, okay, look, we, we, we can't take any more, right? We, we can't take any more. We're, we're drawing the line. We don't want excess dilution when we don't need it. Um, and, and it was, it was not just like random, you know, people like we're talking about, so, so Greg Jackson, Octopus Energy, he, he, he followed through. So he's our, our founding investor, largest single investor in that round. Uh, ben, Ben followed through, um, Sir Ian Cheshire, who's the chairman of Barclays. Um, we have, uh, Jonathan Patrick, founder of Consultant Connect recently exited from there. Uh, Philip Somweber, who, who started Sundrop Farms, which was the largest renewable energy based tomato farm in the world, I think supplying like 15% of, of Australia's tomatoes, um, you know, exited from that at like a phenomenal valuation. Um, Jeremy Oppenheim, uh, founder of Systemic, which is like a sustainability focused investment and consulting firm, 
uh, who had previously founded the sustainability practice at McKinsey like 15 years ago. Uh, Christian Rees Hansen, you know, who, who, who led the transport logistics and infrastructure practice at McKinsey globally and then left to start his own PE fund. Right? And like, there's a long list of people after this. And so like really impressive people, which really validated for us what we were and doing. I, I, I want to stop you here. What is it you guys like to call yourselves? I want to, I want to give you the, you know, it's, it's, I want to give you the pleasure of saying that. I'm not going to take, take the words out. I'll let you say them. I'm not you know, say it's, them. it's, it's you know, obviously, I, I mean, so look, when we were speaking yesterday, right, what I was just telling, what I was saying was like, you know, I think that if you can have an opportunity to do this, right, like that is kind of, for me, that's like a Batman moment, right? That's, that is, that is my ability, right, to, to play the superhero here. But you can't do it alone and, and you need your Justice League with you. And for me, the Justice League is about literally going out and picking each person one by one that you want to join the team, right? You don't want the second tier superheroes or the third tier superheroes. You want the tier one superheroes. You want the superheroes. You want the every, superheroes. Exactly. In every right? category. In every, exactly. And, and I made my little list, right? Much like, you know, Batman had his little list. And, you know, if you've seen the, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of all the recent movies, right? But if you've seen the, the, the recent Justice League, right? I mean, he basically goes one by one in his supercar and he signs up each one and he, he knows who he wants. And we had a little list and I thought, look, this is my list of, of 12, you know, 13 people. And if I can get eight of these 12 or 13 people, I will have my, my Justice League of investors. And I, I got no rejections. I got all 12 you know, or all 13 of the people on my list, right? Like literally every wow. single one. That's off to that. Um, that's, that's an achievement in itself. And you know, we still haven't made an investor deck. So this is literally, this is on the basis of, this is what we're doing. We've got a prototype. This is what the product looks like. And this is, you, you hear us talking about it and, and tell you what our plans are and literally no deck. Um, and, and, you know, then, then it was about the customers, right? Because the, the, the bigger part of the equation is the, if you get the customers, you can get investors. And over the last three weeks, you know, we have a pipeline where the, this is a pipeline where, which it starts where we're saying, we've got an introduction to a chief sustainability officer. That is the customer for us. A chief sustainability officer introduction means you're in our pipeline. And that pipeline for us goes all the way to the, the latest stage, which is where there's one company, which is like a $5 billion uh, food company in the US. And we've done an NDA with them and they're sharing their data. And we're now kind of figuring out scope for the MVP. So that's, that's the funnel. And over the last three weeks, we've added pretty much one a day on average. Uh, so literally wow. like 21-ish of companies in that funnel at the rate of one a day. And we only target companies that are over a billion dollars in revenue. So these are all multi-billion dollar revenue companies in our, in our funnel. And, uh, and literally like, these are all names that, that people know, right? Like 70% of the names are names that anyone would, would recognize, household brands. And, and everyone is happy to speak with us. Everyone is excited, you know, by what we're doing. And, and we just see, you know, this, this Justice League that encompasses investors and customers, this is two thirds of the puzzle, right? And the final third is obviously the team. And so we've got, you know, we, we, we're basically building, you know, in a way, the formula one of sustainability analytics and sustainability engineering, right? The formula one meets the McKinsey, meets the whatever, whoever joins us next. And if you think of this product as, you know, the market that we're coming on to is it's kind of like if you were to go back however many years and the sales and marketing function of a business has just started to exist. Someone has invented the idea of selling and marketing product and created a function around it. And you have gone back in time and you have a CRM tool, right? And you are one of, you know, maybe the first, but maybe one of the first three or four, you know, five, you've got a CRM tool here and you are seeing this massive market open up of people that you can take your CRM tool to. That is what we are, right? We are, you know, one of our advisors said, you guys are basically building the sales force of sustainability, right? Which is, which is effectively what it is. And so we're looking now for people to join that team, complete our justice league. Um, so you know, before actually, we go into that, before we go into the team, we are going to talk about that. And I, know how, and, I, and, I, and I know how passionate you are to get into that. But before we do, it's what well, we can say, we can summarize that you guys are on a mission to save the world, right? You've got your Justice League and you're on a mission to save the world. I mean, that's for sure. and, for fancy sure. and fantastic. For sure. And it's literally when someone says, yeah, I'd like to save the world. You guys, in a way, 
you have a mission, you have a vision, and you're actively chasing that. You know, Mustafa, it's but not... product-wise, before we go, product-wise, what do you guys actually, <laughs> what does, what does this Justice League do? What's the product here? What does it do? So in its simplest version, right, if I talk about what the MVP effectively will, will be, right, it, it is a tool that helps you to measure, uh, track, and report your carbon emissions numbers. That is the very basic bedrock on which the tool is built. And there's all kinds of functionality that we can build on top of that, all kinds of other problems we can solve. As a business, one of our investors uh, gave us great advice, uh, Jonathan Patrick, actually. And he said, look, don't build Homer Simpson's car. And anyone who's seen the Simpsons episode where Homer's brother has a car company and invites Homer to design his ideal car and Homer comes up with something that looks incredible in isolation, but actually solves no one's problem, right? So, so we're starting with the simplest version, measuring, tracking, and reporting carbon emissions. We can do all kinds of cool stuff on top of that. We wanna keep it simple. We want to only respond to customer actual needs. And by actual needs, I mean, not what the customer tells us necessarily, but um, what, what, we've, what we actually assign values to, 